All right, so welcome back to the Young Idealist channel. And today I'm mixing it up a bit. Um, I have a very good friend of mine, but also a brilliant scholar who's both a political theorist and philosopher. I have Matthew McMahon, Dr. Matthew McManus, who is a lecturer in political science at the University of Michigan and the author of The Political Right and Equality, amongst other books. Um, and I think you have like six or seven of them on the like out that right now which is fantastic. Not, not just by me, I should say. Uh, a lot of them are collections and, you know, actually a couple of our friends contributed to them, like our Nietzsche collection and the socialism collection. So, you know, it's a democratic enterprise. So the the reason why I had you come out here is because after reading the book, which by the way is brilliant, um, and the amount of philosophy that's throughout the text is unbelievable. Aristotle, the Scholastics, Roger Filmer, uh, Hume, Burke, De Maestra, Hegel, Dostoevsky, Heidegger, Schmidt, Nietzsche, Dugan. Unbelievable the amount of scholarship that went into this text. So I guess my first question to you is, how did you, how did you, um, how did you approach this text? How did you know, what was the first question that you were looking at and, and about, um, uh, kind of laying out the the main meat of the text. Well, you were actually there uh, when the idea for the text came into being, because uh, it was when we were having my Trump election party back in 2016, uh, which originally was supposed to be my Hillary Clinton election party, but then everything went sour. I'm sure you remember uh, what ended up happening after that, or maybe you don't because everybody kind of decided to drink away their anxieties. But all that aside, right, that was a kind of moment where I really became interested in what the political riot stood for, you know? Doing my degrees before, I had read a lot of the canonical conservative authors, people like Burke or Antonin Scalia, especially I spent a lot of time with, uh, but I never really dived into the tradition in a great deal of detail. Uh, but now it was pretty clear that we are moving into a conservative or a right-wing epoch, uh, not just in the United States uh, or North America, as it turned out, but around the globe. So I really became interested in figuring out what the right stands for, what its main impetus was. Uh, and it turns out that if you look at the scholarship on this, this is a really tough fucking question. Uh, and not just a tough question for me, uh, but even other conservatives have pointed out that they're not exactly sure what their own doctrine consists of, uh, precisely because it has so many variations and permutations depending on where you go. But ultimately, uh, this book centered around the idea that what unites all the very different strands of right-wing thought together is this commitment to the idea that there are demonstrably uh, superior people in society. That's the definition given by F.A. Hayek in his Why I'm Not a Conservative essay. And these demonstrably or recognizably superior people are entitled to more, you know, more status, more power, more affluence, uh, more political agency. Uh, and sometimes they're even construed as having a kind of ontological difference uh, that separates them from other people. If you think about people like uh, Nietzsche or Dugan, for example. Uh, and this commitment, uh, of course, is intellectually defensible, uh, even if I completely disagree with it. Uh, and over the course of the history of the political right, you see a number of authors, some of whom are crackpots and some of whom are really brilliant men, uh, put forward an argument for who they think are the recognizably superior people in society and what they should be entitled to do. I think one of the stark moments um, that, I, that I had while reading this text was, there's a line in the introduction where you're talking about Roger Scruton and Roger Scruton's um, uh, basis or a basic understanding of conservatism. And it was essentially that not all people are equal. Uh, this was something that I found shocking. And, and I guess I guess um, egalitarianism is, a, is an issue that you are also dealing with in the text. So what do you think are um, some of the main tenets between the political right and the political left. And by that, I just mean, you make a really great distinction between natural right and human right when you're talking about scholasticism, which I found unbelievably fascinating. So what are some of the maybe differences between the two um, positions? Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of the book is centered around just this question. Uh, now, I'm writing a new book uh, on the left right now, the political theory of liberal socialism, that's gonna fill in a lot more of the meat uh, on the bones of what it means to be progressive, right? But let's just like uh, take a step back and we'll talk a bit about the right, okay? So one of the core 
and, and like um, aspects of my book is doing historical analysis of right-wing thought that I begin uh, with Aristotle, right? Uh, now, I want to make it really clear that I love Aristotle, right? Uh, I think Aristotle is a brilliant the philosopher, uh, you know, the master of those who know, as Dante used to put it. Uh, and he's undoubtedly had a profound influence on a huge variety of progressive uh, scholars as well, people like Marx, right? Marx was you know, very enthusiastic uh, about Aristotelian thought. So what I'm talking about in the book isn't so much Aristotle the thinker, as what I probably call the Aristotelian universe, right? Or the Aristotelian worldview that's really a nostalgia object for the political right. Uh, and I point out that if you read Aristotle's politics and his ethics, especially, what comes through, at least for conservative readers, is an argument for the demonstrable superiority of certain kinds of people in society and the recognizable inferiority of others, right? Uh, and there are many different ways that this cashes itself out. Uh, it cashes itself out in terms of the fact that some people are more virtuous than others uh, and it, their capacity to hone the virtues is in part a result of their class situatedness because they have access to education and resources that other people don't, uh, but it's also intrinsic in some ways, right? Where it points out that some groups just have a capacity for a deliberative reason that others don't. Uh, men, especially gentlemen, have a very high capacity for deliberative reason. Uh, women, so-so, eh, right? Uh, actually, Aristotle differs from Plato in that respect, quite interestingly, right? Uh, and natural slaves, as he puts it, have no real capacity for deliberative reason. Ergo, they're only fit for slavery, right? Uh, and this maps itself very nicely onto an Aristotelian cosmology and an Aristotelian sociology that's predicated on a notion of hierarchical complementarity, uh, which is the Charles Taylor term. Uh, and hierarchical complementarity just says, look, uh, nature consists of various hierarchies. You know, they're higher order animals and lower order animals higher order forms and lower order forms. And, you know, there are higher kinds of societies and higher kinds of people and lower kinds of people. Now that doesn't mean, and Staler really stresses this, that Aristotle thought the top or the higher forms could do without the bottom forms or that higher kinds of people could just liquidate the lower people. Everyone has their kind of role to play in a hierarchically oriented society. It's just that the people at the top are entitled to a greater degree of dignity, power, agency, wealth, and all the good things in life than the people at the bottom, right? Uh, and this worldview really persists for a very long time, right? You see elements of it in scholastic thought, as I point out. You definitely see huge elements of it uh, in Robert Filmer, who's another main figure. But what I point out is that starting around the time when Stoicism entered the world and Christianity, uh, especially, you started to see a very different view uh, of human society and ontological cosmology enter into the equation. And this is one that's centered around the idea that we're all equal, actually. Uh, the Stoics centered, like, argued that we're all equal in nature uh, because we're all destined to die, right? Uh, and Seneca famously said, look, uh, the same fate awaits the Roman emperor as awaits his slave. So this idea that the Roman empire is some hoity-toity uh, superior to the slave, it's really an artificial one. In fact, we'd be better contemplating uh, the things that unite us, particularly the suffering that unites us, rather than focusing on these kinds of differences. And we all know, of course, that Christianity foregrounded this idea that, you know, we're all children of God. And in fact, you know, as Christ once said, uh, that the Christian God is the God of the least among us, right? That the wretched of the earth, as Phenom once said, and Jesus once said, will know that God is on their side. You know, Christian God is the God of the wretched of the earth. And this idea develops over time uh, in various different permutations and evolves into the philosophy of liberalism, right? Which is where I identify as a liberal socialist, right? Uh, along with socialism, I should say. Uh, and you know, the liberal ethic that you see advanced by Hobbes and Locke is basically a permutation on this, right? Uh, actually in the state of nature, Aristotle is wrong. Uh, Hobbes is really scathing of Aristotle, actually, saying, you know, he's just a complete fool. He had no idea what he's talking about. Because Hobbes says, you know, in the state of nature, actually everybody is equal. Uh, they're certainly almost entirely equal physically because any two people can kill, gang up and kill even the strongest person. Uh, and we're almost all intellectually equal as well. Uh, and Hobbes even says, if you imagine yourself to be intellectually unequal to another person, well, everybody thinks that they're smarter than the next man. And that's probably just vanity or vainglory anyway, right? Uh, and over time, this evolves into a basis for revolutionary movements centered around equality uh, or liberty, equality, and fraternity, the revolutionary slogan. Uh, and with the emergence of the revolutionary era, you see the right emerge, uh, trying to recover this older way of looking at things, but having to reflect upon and instantiate it in new forms in order to kind of make it more sexy uh, for a modern audience. Yes, yes. So the, the this this Enlightenment um, philosophical movement, you know, the, the fervor for the French Revolution, which 
you know, was around from, uh, you know, the time of Kant all the way to Schelling. Oh, yeah. Um, very, very, very cool. Um, one of the one of the interesting um, things I was thinking about as I was reading this is, why do you think there is this push to go back, this kind of nostalgia to go back um, to an almost classical age? I mean, is is this a, a, a kind of logical, tenable thing that they think that that is able to uh, be drawn out? Or um, is it just, do they see, I guess that's what I'm, I'm essentially asking. I, I've written down some of these questions and I was thinking about them as you, as you lay out so many brilliant uh, points. Yeah, I mean, there are many different forms that this takes, right? Uh, I'll just give you a quick one, right? So you're talking a little bit about scholasticism, right? Uh, so a lot of Christian conservatives, right, are really attracted to a kind of synthesis of Aristotelian cosmology uh, with, you know, various kind of Christian flourishes. Uh, and the reason why they are attracted to hierarchical variations of this is their understanding of this cosmology uh, is essentially, again, hierarchical and orderly. Uh, where everything in the universe has its place under God. Uh, and even though there is a kind of equality that exists under God, uh, it's still a fundamentally stratified kind of existence uh, where, you know, within in the real world, uh, there'll be meaningful differences between people uh, and these are set by God and it's not up to you to change them. Uh, and a good metaphor for this that Don Herzog points out in his book, uh, Poisoning the Minds of Lower Orders, is many medieval thinkers drawing on syntheses of Christianity and Aristotle were really attracted to this image of a great chain of being that people have probably seen, right? Uh, yeah, exactly, right? So, you know, if you've read Dante's uh, Divine Comedy, you'll probably also be familiar with this, right? There's this idea that, you know, there are the demons, then worms, uh, then lower kinds of animals, then human beings, and within human beings, you know, there's a further stratification uh, between, you know, peasants and then knights and then lords and then you know the king and then the pope uh, and then above you know human beings there are angels and archangels and then god right uh, and everything is of course has a kind of equivalence uh before god uh but is unequivalent to itself outside of god right within the temporal realm and this kind of idea of an orderly hierarchical cosmos where everyone knows their place and where they don't have the option to elect not to fulfill the role assigned from them is something that conservatives are extremely nostalgic for. And, you know, you don't need to take my word for it. My recommendation would be to go read uh, Evan Burke's Reflections on the Revolution in France, where about midway through the book, uh, he says, listen, you know, uh, you entered into a divine compact uh, that imposes necessities upon you. And you did not choose your role within society. The role chose you. Uh, and how dare you think that you're entitled to decide to do something differently? Uh, and of course, this has a fundamental uh, relationship to an argument for inequality. Uh, the idea being that, look, if you're a peasant, that's where you belong, right? That's where nature or God or necessity puts you. Uh, and you have a telos or a role to fulfill within that. And this idea that you could kind of make up your own uh, will only lead to chaos, anarchy, a lack of virtue, uh, expropriation of private property, all these kinds of terrifying things that Burke and other conservatives don't want. Yes, I, I you can see the same thing from, I never, I never read the text, but I've seen him uh, vent about this. I've seen Ben Shapiro always talk about the grandiose system of Jerusalem and Athens, right. um, and that's it. And this is, you know, reason and revelation, and these are the two um, things that great that give humanity this kind of glory. Um, if you don't mind, I'd like to move to um, Heidegger, Nietzsche, and Dugan because <laughs> the, um, the the holy trio. <laughs> yes, the holy trio. It's interesting because when we both did our undergrad, sorry, we both did our grad, graduate studies together. And at a time, Heidegger was getting a kind of a, a comeback and then the black books came out. Um, yeah, that and then, that, didn't it? yeah, and then that kind of took away a little bit of the sway. Um, but it's interesting how, as you, as you point out, they have, uh, the right has, in a sense, kind of cultivated this odd line of thinkers of uh, Schmidt, who, by the way, is a brilliant writer, oh, yeah, um, oh, yeah. but uh, <laughs> disturbing ideology, but also Nietzsche and Heidegger and the reading that they have of it, as you point out, this kind of nihilistic, 
you know, Nietzschean, I'm overpowering you, my power over you, um, that you bring out really nicely. So, and it seems that this, this kind of Nietzschean, Heideggerian, Dugian, fascistic line is then linked back to the kind of classics. And I'm, I'm thinking of um, an example of Strauss. You bring up Strauss, who we both know is a huge figure with West Coast Straussians and the whole Claremont Institute and that that think tank. So I'm at, so I guess my question is more along the lines of their reading versus the actual real reading. So I know you and I both have problems with Nietzsche and Heidegger's philosophy, and there are some good tenets to it, but the way that they read them seems individualistic as opposed to collective. The individual becomes much more worthier, much more uh, over everybody else, over the unwashed mass. And do you think this is a like a proper interpretation of how they of how they read these these said thinkers? We'll get the Dugan in a second. I just wanted to know um, of what what you think of their reading of Heidegger and Nietzsche. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is such a complicated question. Do you mind if we break it into two? We'll talk about Nietzsche first and then Heidegger second. Absolutely, so, absolutely, for sure. Okay. Good, yeah, because I don't think I could do them justice by kind of conflating the two of them together. So let's start with Nietzsche, right? Uh, so I argue in the book that along with Dostoevsky, uh, Nietzsche is the absolute pinnacle uh, of right-wing thought. And I stand by that, right? Uh, he's an extraordinary thinker. He's brilliant. Uh, you know, I don't use the word very often, but genius seems appropriate here, right? Uh, which isn't to say that I agree with him about almost anything at all, right? Uh, I repudiate his positions very starkly, but it's important to acknowledge uh, as progressives like myself, that the political right is capable of producing uh, individuals and thinkers of the caliber of Nietzsche, right? So let's just talk a bit about what makes him distinctive. So one of the things that you see with Nietzsche is the political right adopting a kind of revolutionary or reactionary modernism for the first time. And there's a specific reason for that. So earlier conservative thinkers of the sort that I talk about in the book, people like Burke and Demestra, have this nostalgia for going back uh, to a time period before the advent of liberalism, democracy, uh, and eventually socialism. And this usually takes the form, again, of going to a kind of conservative Christianity uh, coupled with support for aristocracy, right? This is Burke and Demestra's entire line. Uh, and they have various different arguments for this. But what makes Nietzsche remarkable uh, is Nietzsche is a genealogist of the first caliber. Uh, and he is one of the first to say that there's something extremely artificial about this decision, want to go, this desire to go back to something that's just immediately antecedent to liberalism and republicanism and socialism, because he says that's the environment in which these doctrines emerged, right? Uh, you can't sit there and want to just return to the soil out of which the poisonous plant sprouted, right? You're just gonna get the poison plant returned. And he goes through a lot of different permutations uh, of his main outlook. Uh, but what he eventually concludes is that the toxic seed uh, of egalitarian decadence uh, was laid all the way back in Platonism. Now, this might seem like a very odd argument uh, coming from, you know, Nietzsche, because, you know, we all know Plato supported and I dream of philosopher kings, right? Uh, but as early as the birth of tragedy, uh, Nietzsche points out that from his standpoint, Socrates was a decadent figure, right? Uh, he was opposed to the aristocracy of his time. He loved pricking uh, at their consciences uh, and suggesting that their desire for war and conquest uh, and, you know, grandiose projects uh, were all not worthwhile. Uh, and of course, he even points out that Plato adopted a kind of universalistic epistemology at various points. Uh, he didn't have an aristocratic mentality in him that went far enough, uh, because we all know, of course, that Socrates, or sorry, that Plato said, even the slave can be capable of contemplating the forms under the right conditions because they are a priori. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody will have the will to kind of extricate themselves from the cave uh, and kind of rise above. And this is why some Nietzscheans find redeeming values in Plato that sometimes Nietzsche himself didn't find, right? Uh, but, you know, for Nietzsche, uh, this idea is already latently problematic. Uh, and he says it's also a kind of resentiment driven motivation uh, because the aristocratic moralities that preceded Platonism uh, also pleasure in the kind of things that Plato condemns, like the body, for example, right? Uh, if you think about the Homeric idols, uh, you know, Achilles is wise Achilles, according to Homer, you know, Basically a dumbass is the only way to call it, but he's a very powerful, 
brutal person. He relishes in his strength. He takes supreme gratification in being a kind of master unto himself uh, and not caring very much for anybody else's truth, but the one that he wills into being uh, and imposes upon others without even really considering very deeply uh, what their own feelings and reality are. Uh, now, Plato, of course, is, condemns this, right? And he puts forward a moral ideal instead, uh, which is that we should abnegate these desi this desire for strength, certainly in this world, uh, and dedicate ourselves to a kind of perfection uh, that exists in another world, okay? Uh, and Nietzsche also sees this as very problematic because he says, now we have a bifurcation between this world and the next world, okay? Uh, and the ultimate conclusion is nihilistic because this world is so absolutely abjectly horrible that the only way it can be redeemed is if there's a kind of platonic heaven uh, that we can one day have access to, uh, which is this kind of seed of this nihilistic outlook. But of course, right, uh, Nietzsche says all of this is just kind of throat clearing uh, for the real problem that emerges when Christianity appears uh, and democratizes this platonic uh, philosophy in a very profound way. Uh, and he makes no bones about it, right, that Christ is really the only foe, as he once put it, who was worthy of him, right? Because uh, Christ, you know, in Christianity, Platonism for the people, takes this idea uh, that we should be moral uh, and that the world that we live in uh, is banal uh, or full of suffering compared to the world that we'll live in uh, or that uh, the world of eternity uh, and transforms it into a world historical doctrine uh, that everybody can understand, you know, including, you know, the lowest among us. Uh, and more than this, it doesn't just democratize this idea, uh, it morally emphasizes uh, a fundamentally anti-aristocratic outlook uh, by stressing this idea that the least among us are actually the highest in God's eyes, and the kind of people that Jesus and God care about most are the beggars, the whores, the losers, as it were, of society. Uh, and Nietzsche says, ultimately, this Christian idea uh, implodes its own metaphysics, which is a remarkable claim, right, where he points out in the genealogy of morals that all great things overcome themselves because they can't be overcome by anything else. Uh, and the will to truth that Christianity inherits from Platonism eventually leads it to ask its most daring proposition, uh, which is that we're going to be committed to truth as good Christians. Eventually, we need to question the truth of Christianity, uh, including its metaphysics. So the Platonism disappears from Christianity eventually, but the morality doesn't, the slave morality, right? Uh, that evolves into liberalism and socialism and democracy, right? Um, and anarchism, right? Uh, all of whom are still committed to this idea that the least among us shall be first, uh, and we will be a society of brothers and sisters cooperating together. Uh, and Nietzsche says, that's horrible, right? This is the natural evolution of this kind of platonic Christian synthesis. And the only solution to it isn't to do what people like Demetri and Burke want, which is to go back to the time period of the Ancien regime that was responsible for this decadence emerging in the first place. We got to wipe the slate all the way clean uh, and go back to this originary point where, you know, the Greek, the pre-Socratics existed, uh, and you found truly strong people who kind of created their own philosophies beyond good and evil, and certainly without any kind of concern for the herd. And that's, of course, what a lot of his positive philosophy is centered on. I was, I was, as you were depicting that very clear and succinct um, reading of Nietzsche, I was thinking back to a, a, a Twitter space that I was in, a philosophical space, where someone... Um, who has more right leanings uh, was explaining the eagle and the snake mm -hmm. uh, in terms of masculinity and femininity and how the real masculine man, according to Nietzsche, is the eagle um, and how the last man um, is this snake that then turns into the leftist. Uh, so it's interesting. Oh, yeah. It's interesting how you set that up and how and how it's it's read um, systematically. So now Heidegger, what do you think well, Heidegger- I just wanted to add oh. one more thing about Nietzsche, if I could. Sure, which is sure. Again, about his positive morality, because you're absolutely right that there's this kind of macho quality to it, which is why it's not a surprise that people like Bronze Age pervert, for example, uh, are very attracted to his philosophy. Now, Bronze Age pervert is a kind of perversion, appropriately, appropriately of Nietzsche, because Nietzsche is just a vastly more sophisticated and deep thinker uh, than Bab could aspire to be. Uh, but, you know, it's important to stress that Nietzsche's- own positive philosophy is very much a kind of negation of this platonic Christian heritage. Uh, and he puts forward a view that he characterizes or that is characterized uh, as aristocratic radicalism. 
Uh, and he makes this very clear in Beyond Good and Evil and The World of Power and a huge number of other books where he says, every kind of great society that has produced life-affirming values and cultures has been an aristocratic one, uh, including societies that have had vast numbers of slaves to kind of relieve uh, the great men from the duty of engaging in banalities uh, so that they can focus on these kind of higher order or great projects. Uh, and he can sometimes be extraordinarily uh, vindictive about this. Uh, so in The Will to Power, he famously said, I don't great, yet grant the great mass of people the right to life. Uh, there can be unfit peoples too, right? Uh, and also in The Will to Power, he actually rejects the idea that he is for uh, what he calls an individualist ethic, right? Where he says, my philosophy is not about individualism. My philosophy is about, what he characterizes it, rank ordering. Uh, and the way that we can understand this is that some people are entitled to be individuals because some people know how to be individuals. Uh, but the great mass of people, you know, who want to become socialists and Democrats and liberals uh, are swine, right? Uh, and they will never become individuals. They'll only pull the real individuals back. So the only thing that should happen to them is to be the slaves of the great men who are capable of individualism. And this is very much a kind of aristocratic radicalism, right? Uh, and it's important to note that Nietzsche had a lot of political views at his own time, and he thought that Bismarckian Germany was too soft uh, and too left-wing for his taste, right? Uh, now, ponder that for a minute, right? The reactionary Bismarckian German empire, the bane of all the democracies and the socialists everywhere, they were too woke for Nietzsche, right? And that should really tell us something. It's interesting because... Um during the time of my undergraduate and I guess your undergraduate as well, we, we were living in that age where Kaufman was trying to, oh, yeah. you know, un, unravel Nietzsche's alignment with the, with the Nazis because of his sister. And so we, we were starting to see a positive, uh, positive Nietzsche. Uh, and then we, you know, ergo the 80s and the Deleuzian left Nietzschean um, arises. Um, so it, it's so interesting to see the, the two-sided snake of, of Nietzsche, I guess, you know, the, the left Nietzschean um, and the so-called right Nietzschean, which I think you're right about in his reading. Um, I was wondering now if we could turn to Heidegger. Of course, of course. Because this is, this is but also back to Nietzsche for one point, um, it's also Peterson as well, too. Peterson has yeah. this, this reading of Nietzsche as well, too. But Heidegger is the one that I think well, Peterson, um, I should just say, Nietzsche would say that he doesn't have any balls, right? Uh, because this is his whole thing, right? He's like, you know, we should have to appreciate, we have to appreciate, you know, the way that the modern, postmodern book left was like motivated by resentment, right? And envy. Oh my God, are they just narcissistic moralists, right? Uh, and, you know, that's definitely a theme he brings up from Nietzsche. What he doesn't take from Nietzsche, though, is, of course, Peterson wants to defend Judeo-Christian civilization because he also adopts this more conventional conservative view that a certain kind of Christianity is a bulk work against these intelligentarian inclinations. And what made Nietzsche have just a much braver and more interesting thinker than Peterson could ever be is his willingness to go all the way and say, no, you know, really, those postmodern neo-Marxists aren't the antithesis of Christianity. They are Christianity. They're what Christianity looks like secularized in the 21st century. Uh, so if you want to get rid of them, then you need to go back and re-crucify uh, the person who deserved to be crucified at the beginning. Wow. Um, one, of the, one of the main themes that I think um, that is jarring as well, um, that you do so well at, is this talk of authenticity mm -hmm. that you get from existentialism but a, a very inaccurate reading of, of authenticity. But, you know, authenticity in regards to, again, a weird reading of Heidegger where the Das Mann or the they is this kind of unwashed mass, the, it's the woke people, it's the woke left um, versus, you know, everyone that just wants some specific order. And Heidegger's reading, the, the reading of Heidegger, Heidegger's own, dealings with uh, national socialism and there's lots there's lots tainted oh, yeah. in his writing especially to the 30s and you bring out you do a lot you a very good job of doing this um and i've noticed that a, a majority of the people from the right tend to not want to deal with heidegger's past i mean you see people like richard woolen um uh, victor hugo is it victor hugo no no um i'm thinking somebody else you know 
bringing out, even they say like, we shouldn't throw away Heidegger, which is the concern that the right have throwing away this text, but is we should be dealing with it head first. Mm -hmm. um, and so why do you think some of these tenants from Heidegger are being re-employed by the right? Um, well, that's a great question. And I want to make it clear, right? Uh, I mean, when I was younger, I considered myself a Heideggerian, right? Uh, when I met you, you know, I think I used to introduce myself as like, I am a Heideggerian, you know, legal theorist or something, right? That was my stick. In fact, you probably remember Brayton Polka used to get angry at me, the class that I met you in, because he was like, no, 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 not Heidegger, right? You know, he gets everything backwards. And I'd be like, no, Heidegger, 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 right? So this was a partly a therapeutic exercise for me. Uh, of coming terms with my own past. And I want to make it very clear. I do think that Heidegger has a lot of profound insights, right? He is a great philosopher and an extraordinarily creative figure. Uh, and I say that with a million caveats that I'll get into, right? But in particular, uh, I'm enough of a phenomenologist to really appreciate uh, this notion of ecstatic time that he puts forward uh, and the way that that frames not just our sense of self, but our interactions within the world, right? That it's very difficult to understand my relationship to an object if I consider it kind of in the icy present, right? Uh, without appreciating the fact that I'm drawing on this reservoir of memories, right? Uh, and teachings, right? About what it means to, you know, pick up this cup before I grab it here in the present. But of course, I'm also extended ahead of myself where I might very well really live because the reason why I draw upon these memories to pick up this cup in the present is, of course, because I'm thirsty uh, and I want to satiate that thirst. Uh, and I think I'll feel better about that, right? Uh, now, it's more complicated than that, and we don't want to get into all the details of it. But I think that this is really a brilliant idea, right, uh, that transforms our understanding of the phenomenology of the human relationship or the human experience of time, right? About the only thing that I'm a little critical of Heidegger on on this point, uh, is that I think that Merleau-Ponty uh, is and Simone de Beauvoir are right that he undervalues uh, the body uh, in terms of how it is that uh, we need to understand, you know, our interactions with the world. Now that might seem a little bit strange, considering Heidegger always emphasizes, you know, the kind of past that human beings set themselves. Uh, but I think that there's definitely a kind of abstract quality to this, at least compared to what you get in the materialism of people like Ponty or de Beauvoir, right? So. Let's put that aside. Where do the problems come in? I think that the problems come in around the time where you get to the latter parts uh, of being in time. Uh, because this is where, even though he doesn't speak in a kind of normative way, you start to see certain kinds of lessons uh, put forward about the debasement of modernity and, and the inauthenticity of modern man in modern context. Uh, you know, a good friend of mine, uh, John Gans, once said that if you read the latter half of Being Time, Heidegger will sometimes say things like, I make no moral judgments about things, but every single modern person is a giant pussy who's running away from death. Uh, and we're living in it with a bunch of pussies surrounding us at all times, and they're never going to amount to anything. But I make no judgments about this, right? Uh, and it's kind of funny and a little bit mean, but this it's true, right? Most people who read Being Time, that's kind of the conclusion you get, right? So let's talk a bit about that, right? So Heidegger posits this idea that once we understand the futurity uh, of human nature, this idea that our structural primordial ideality is care and that we're extended ahead of ourselves, uh, we need to ask ourselves the kind of plans that the sign sets for itself. Uh, and Heidegger says that an awareness of death uh, and the anxiety that results from this might very well induce me to take on great projects that will give a kind of authenticity to my life uh, and make it come across almost as if it was a destiny or as if I had a destiny, right? Uh, but most of us will choose to flee from the anxiety that this induces uh, into the world of Dasman and authenticity uh, or the world of the they, right? Uh, where instead of committing ourselves to these authentic projects, uh, resolutely uh, anticipating our death, uh, we'll engage in idle chatter uh, and decadent kind of materialism. Uh, and this is far easier, Heidegger says, in being in time, uh, in the context of big cities, big modern cities especially, where there's so many distractions to kind of pry us away uh, from these authentic kinds of projects, right? Uh, and this already has a reactionary quality to it, right? Uh, the criticism of urban spaces, the criticisms of dialogue, the insularity uh, that the great man needs to cultivate in order to commit himself to his great projects, right? Which again, echoes Nietzsche, right? Uh, and I wanna point out that no matter what Heidegger says, 
uh, this is should be problematic to any philosopher because I always like to put forward, of course, that Socrates uh, at the beginning uh, of Western philosophy constantly said that the philosopher must be a part of the city, cultivate their talents during the city, and has a moral responsibility to the city. Uh, all of this that Heidegger implicitly denies. So that's kind of the beginning of this critique. But where does it really kick up a notch? Well, in the 1930s, a lot of these anxieties about das Mann and inauthenticity really become radicalized. Uh, now, I'm going to be leaping frogging ahead a little bit here to synthesize a few different works together to kind of spit the narrative. Uh, but he starts to develop an introduction to metaphysics, his story uh, of where the fall into Das Mann began, right? Uh, and really the way that we need to understand this is in terms of the history of philosophy. And he develops his own very complicated account of this. Uh, and for Heidegger, right, uh, the beginning of philosophy was an epoch that was far greater than all the permutations that we've seen thus far, uh, because the pre-Socratics, particularly as you know, Parmenides, contemplated the question of being directly, right, uh, and allowed it to animate uh, their understanding of the world. Uh, whereas we, in the modern era, have eventually, through a very long, complicated process, uh, reduced being down to the being of beings, right, and not just the being of beings, uh, but the being of beings that is just standing reserved to be manipulated for human purposes in order to gratify human needs. Uh, and Heidegger says in Introduction to Metaphysics that this technical approach to the world uh, that really kind of gets a big jolt in the arm around Cartesianism uh, is at the basis of modern liberalism and socialism, which are metaphysically the same, according to him, and the political embodiment of the inauthenticity that he's talking about. Now, this might seem very strange to anybody in the Anglosphere, right? Like liberalism and socialism metaphysically same, like, are you fucking high, right? Too many, eating too many shrooms in the Black Forest or something. But he actually has a point, right? Where he says, look, you know, both liberalism and socialism are technical modern doctrines. Uh, nominally, they're committed to this idea that all people are equal and that the role of a good society is to try to gratify uh, everyone's equal pressing needs as effectively or efficiently as possible. And from Heidegger's standpoint, the only meaningful difference between liberalism and socialism is that liberals say this is the best way to build a refrigerator and socialists say, no, 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 no. This is a better way to build a refrigerator and distribute it, right? That's what this whole debate ultimately boils down to. And Heidegger despises it, right? Now, his view of this, I think, is warped beyond imagining, okay? But that's the essence of it. Uh, he draws this kind of equivalence between the two, and he feels that only a truly spiritual people uh, can rise above the muck. Uh, and the spiritual people that are going to do this, of course, no surprise, are the Germans, the people of the center between Russia and America, the Soviet Union, uh, and the kind of capitalist West. Uh, and we can get into the details of his support for Nazis if you want, uh, but there's no doubt that he saw in Hitler uh, and in the Nazi movement a kind of spiritual rebirth uh, that portended uh, a new age of authenticity with the sign now understood very collectively, uh, not just for Germany, but for the entire Western world and indeed for the entire world. Uh, and Heidegger went to some very sinister places uh, in this at this point, right? Uh, talking about how the reign of the mediocre and the, democ the demos was over. Uh, now would be the era of, you know, the truly exceptional individuals, in this case, the Germans, and especially the members of the Nazi party. Uh, and they would kind of bring about a new future. Uh, and he also gave in to some extraordinarily horrible uh, anti-Semitic rhetoric uh, at this point, as we all know, right? Talking about Jewish materialism, uh, how, you know, the Jews were the kind of people of liberalism and socialism, even conspiratorially insinuating at various points that they were responsible for propagating uh, these doctrines, you know, uh, in order to undermine, um, you know, Germany in a variety of different ways. And how to be extremely hypocritical uh, about this in the most callous possible way. Uh, I mean, one of the best examples that Emmanuel Fay brings up is that when the Germans defeated France in 1940, you know, we all know the tanks. I mean, I know you love World War II games like I do, right? So, you know, you know, tanks rolled into France, defeated, uh, you know, the uh, French army. Heidegger declared that it was a new epoch in the history of being because the German army had defeated the French army. But then, of course, you know, when the Americans and Soviets just completely obliterated Germany, his response was, well, this decides nothing, you know. Uh, over a good not long enough period of time, I'll still be proven right, you know, because that was the kind of guy he was. Uh, and I hate to say it, but as great as Heidegger had the potential to be, 
uh, he almost comes across, especially near the end, as something of a comic figure, uh, precisely for all these reasons. You know, the man of authenticity who ended up supporting really the least authentic regime uh, that I could ever imagine. Uh, and this is why I closed my chapter with him with some ruminations by Adorno, right? And this idea of the jargon of authenticity. Uh, because authenticity or an emphasis on authenticity, stripped of notions of responsibility, otherness, uh, and moral response, uh, sorry, and moral seriousness, uh, can really just transform itself very quickly into a justification for narcissism, aggression, uh, and what Eric Fromm used to call uh, this yearning for subordination, uh, subordination of the other and the subordination of oneself to a higher cause, whatever that might happen to be, no matter how violent uh, or horrible. Uh, and I think that this is the ultimate endpoint of Heidegger's philosophy, uh, unless one seriously reconfigures uh, the elements that were latent at the beginning that don't move down this dark path. I remember um, sitting in a fourth year feminist epistemology class taught by um, one of my mentors, Lorraine Code, and she was teaching from her text, uh, what, sh what Can She Know? And she mm -hmm. has a great criticism in that text in the fourth chapter on Heidegger. And she said something that I just made me think for a second. She says, it's, it's hard to read Being in Time without thinking that Dasein is a German in a Nazi uniform, yeah. goose stepping. Um, <laughs> yeah. She said that in the middle of the lecture, and that kind of made me just go, whoa. Um, before we we move onward into even maybe more Heidegger or even um, Dugan, I wanted to bring up something that I thought is kind of hits home in a sense, because I, I get this a lot. Um, the dealing of romanticism and how romanticism is, is linked to um, Nazism. And of course, um, when I'm discussing German, classical German philosophy and German idealism, it's really hard to conflate, mm -hmm. you know, romanticism, which there were an English, there's an English romanticism, there's a French romanticism, there's a German romanticism, there's so much, oh, especially yeah, yeah. especially the tenets of like the Jena romantics that I love, like Hölderlin, Schiller, Schelling, early Fichte, et cetera. And their ideas were, their ideas were, uh, you know, an anti-enlightenment. You know, they were anti-enlightenment in the sense that of the mechanization of the world. And some of this, some of this carries on into Heidegger's readings of Herderlin, the whole Blut and Boden of um, uh, bread and oh, sorry, um, blood and, and ground soil. And I was I was wondering your thoughts on 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 this kind of romantic purging um, from its origins into the right, because you both, I know you both, we both, um, well, we both enjoy um, Ernst Bloch's book, The Spirit of Utopia, which is kind of a, a Schillingian novelistian Marxist um, lens. He so, makes it work, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he does make it work. Um, are there problems with, with romanticism and, or, do you think romanticism has been distorted to fit a specific um, a narrative? Sorry, I can't talk right now. I needed my third coffee of the day. <laughs> no, that's a great question, right? And I want to say I don't think so, but with a million caveats, right? So I'll make I'll be pretty brief about this, right? Uh, romanticism can be understood as a complement uh, or a correction to enlightenment. Uh, and in these kinds of circumstances, from Rousseau onward, I think that there are a lot of good romantic critiques of, you know, uh, the Enlightenment that are entirely legitimate and that push the Enlightenment towards its mature phase in a way that was absolutely necessary, right? Uh, I'll just give, you know, two quick examples here. John Stuart Mill, who's a thinker I admire a great deal politically, right, uh, took romanticism very seriously, right, where he pointed out that this idea that we are all atomic individuals uh, just focused on gratifying our hedonic desires seems very crass uh, or even pig-like. Uh, and people very understandably object to it. Uh, and it's actually an insight he drew from another figure I talk about in the book who is very conservative called um, Carlyle, right? Uh, but what Mills does is say, there's no reason to abandon modernity uh, to these reactionaries. Instead, we can make an argument for why a progressive socialist liberalism is actually entirely compatible with romanticism. Uh, and we do this by pointing out that 
enabling people to be free uh, and to form solidaristic associations with one another will allow them to express their individuality, right? Uh, as Mill once famously put it, right? Uh, to allow their being to become like a living tree, right? That grows and evolves according to its inner nature, right? That's a very romantic idea. Uh, and he even makes this very clear where he points out, it's not important just to ask ourselves, how happy am I? It's also important to ask ourselves, what kind of person am I? And why do I want to be happy? And what does happiness mean to someone like me, right? So that's one permutation of romanticism that I find very appealing. Another that's very prominent, of course, is the Marxist uh, you know, critique of, capitalist enlightenment, which drew insight from romanticism, uh, while also, you know, transforming it in a variety of different ways, right? But, you know, Hegel foregrounds this idea of the alienation of man uh, in, you know, early modern societies, uh, and how, on the one hand, this emphasis on freedom that's so persistent in the modern era comes into conflict uh, with the reality of unfreedom uh, in the state. And Marx picks that up and says, look, you know, very similar things that are happening in the economy, right? Where bourgeois whites promise us every freedom in the world, uh, but economic necessity compels us all, uh, worker and capitalist alike, uh, to do things that may very well be anterior, or sorry, uh, antecedent or contrary, excuse me, to our self-interest in the long run, uh, but we're compelled to do them because of the mute propulsion of capital as it exists right now, right? Uh, and this, of course, is also alienating. So these are versions of the romantic critique that I find very compelling. Uh, and many thinkers that I admire pick those up, uh, you know, from Rawls to Marcuse to Wendy Brown, right? But there's another version of romanticism that absolutely can turn in a romantic and ultimately fascistic direction. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail about this because, boy, oh boy, uh, could I go on about it for a long time? Uh, I'm almost tempted to just say, read Lukács' Destruction of Reason, right? Which is uh, the great Marxist reading of um, romantic German philosophy uh, or Germany's path to Hitler in the road, I'm oh, sorry, Germany's road to Hitler uh, in the spheres philosophy, as he called it, right? Uh, but what Lukács argues, putting very simply, I think is generally correct, that certain kinds of romantics adopted an elitist attitude towards the world. That's the only way to describe it. And saw themselves as the kind of man outside uh, of society, right? Uh, surrounded by decadence, surrounded by the herd or the mass or the swine who were never capable of thinking great thoughts or feeling great feelings. Uh, and initially this took the form, according to Lukács, of Schopenhauerian philosophies, especially this idea of withdrawing from life and withdrawing from society uh, in order to cultivate a kind of stoic or Buddhist attitude in relation to it. Uh, and Lucas says, there's no denying the fact that this has conservative connotations, right? Schopenhauer in the 1840s actually helped Prussian soldiers uh, shoot at the revolutionaries that were rebelling all throughout German cities. Uh, yeah, it's true, uh, because, you know, he didn't like being disturbed in his tranquility by the swinish masses uh, who thought that they can improve their life futilely uh, by rebelling against the system, right? Uh, but then Lukács says, this evolves in a more active form by the time you get to people like Nietzsche and Chamberlain and a variety of different nationalists, uh, where they start saying that the way to overcome the decadence of modern society is to tear out the root of that decadence, which is, of course, this commitment to equality, to liberal freedoms uh, and to democracy, right? All of which allow the herd or the swine uh, too much of an influence uh, on contemporary affairs. This all evolves over a wide variety of different, in a wide variety of different ways uh, into fascism, right? Uh, where Mussolini uh, drawing upon figures like Nietzsche and like Sorel uh, actually is very clear that fascism doesn't have to be bound to any kind of truth except a private truth, right? Which is again, a romantic inclination. Uh, and in the 1920s, he even says, is my myth of a aggrandized Italian state true? Who cares, right? Uh, it's an edifying myth. It's something that elevates us above the mundane and banal uh, and bourgeois, right? Uh, and of course, it elevates us above the democratic uh, and the egalitarian as well, uh, because the average person wouldn't be capable of living up to such a myth, which is why they need a great man in order to lead them and to propagate this myth, right? So in those kind of circumstances, obviously, we have to be very critical of romanticism's anti-rationalism and its tendency to evolve in chauvinistic directions. So my view of romanticism, you know, 
a necessary uh, but dangerous kind of compliment to invite. Yes, like I can see that I can see your point, especially coming um, out of people like Spangler and the decline of West yeah. that that's now also being appropriated. Um, I want to now turn to Dugan because he's the okay. he's the big bad baddie now apparently. Um, Dugan and his kind of uh, Eurasian uh, political philosophy or the fourth politics. Now Dugan is an interesting character because. Dugan has very, you know, serious ties to fascism, and the fact that he's being employed by people like Millerman, who just says he's translating him, but he's also teaching him privately. All he's doing, yeah. yeah, all he's doing really uh, is almost is scary. So the character and figure of what Dugan stands for, and it's almost like it, they don't even care about his political political. Um, associations what they care about is that he stands against liberalism he stands against this and and we need to move away from this from from all of this so i was wondering if you could bring up some of of the reasons why dugan is standing so firmly with all of them why he's this new you know uh, shining figure for the right yeah, absolutely. And I want to point out, uh, I'm very critical of Millerman's whitewashing uh, of Dugan in the book. Uh, he's almost a foil for that section, right? Uh, but, but the reason is Millerman characterizes Dugan uh, not as a fascist, but as he calls it, a, a conservative populist, right? Uh, and he even puts forward this idea that Dugan is a kind of Democrat. Uh, he puts forward a vision of conservative democracy or Russian democracy, right? Uh, except it's not really democratic, right? Because the people have a destiny and must participate in the fulfillment of that destiny. Uh, but the destiny is understood by, as Millerman puts it, qua Dugan, the single ones, right? Uh, these kinds of Heideggerian Duganish philosophers who know what the people must do uh, and can knew whatever it is that they need to in order to get the people to fulfill its destiny, uh, which of course is not really democratic at all, right? Uh, it's a kind of fascist populism. And this is what I'm getting into, right? So. I spent a lot of time talking about fascism in the book, uh, and the definition that I give is heavily drawn by, uh, sorry, drawn from uh, Roger Griffin, right? Uh, particularly uh, his fantastic books on fascism uh, and the nature of fascism, along with some stuff by Paxton, Richard Evans, uh, Scholars of Nazism, you name it, right? Uh, and I took this very seriously, but Roger Griffin puts forward this idea that the essence of fascism is what he calls palingenetic ultranationalism. Uh, now that's a big word, but it's a very, very helpful one, where it says that the basic fascist myth uh, is that one it belongs to a great nation or a great people, right? Uh, and it has been badly trampled upon uh, by external enemies and internal enemies, uh, mostly from the left, uh, which is to see very broadly, right? Marxism, liberalism, all the decadent modern forces. Uh, and you know that includes, again, enemies external, the United States uh, in the case, uh, and France uh, and the Soviet Union in the case of, you know, Germany and Italy, uh, the United States and the broader West in the case of Russia, right? Uh, and unless something is done, the nation is doomed to the ash heap of history. But if one puts one's faith in the single ones, right, the people who understand the destiny of the people, then like a phoenix, this great nation can resuscitate itself uh, through a process of palingenesis, right, or rebirth and assume its correct role in the world, uh, which invariably uh, for sufficiently large fascist nations means engaging in projects of grand imperial conquest. Uh, and Dugan is no different from this in any meaningful way. That's him to a T, right? Where in uh, his foundations of geopolitics and his introduction to Eurasianism, the entire narrative, if you want to call it that, is look, uh, Russia, you know, the nation of the land has been humiliated, battered, beaten uh, by you know, the people of the sea, the United States, the liberal countries. Uh, and it's also been corrupted from within uh, by liberalizing forces uh, and also the sedentary qualities of a long history of you know, communist governance, right? Which was a kind of artificial importation. Uh, but you know, uh, with the right government in power, which Dugan for a long time thought was Putin, but he goes back and forth on this, uh, you know, Russia will be able to form meaningful alliances with a whole array of covertly colorful anti-liberal forces. Uh, and these include white nationalists, Islamic fundamentalists, uh, 
European uh, Christian nationalists and racists, right? Uh, anybody really that Dugan could get his hands on. Uh, and this cabal will, of course, defeat the United States and the nations at sea, overcome the liberalizing elements within Eurasia, and establish a new global empire, right? Uh, which is, you know, again, par for the course with any number of fascist mythologies, right down uh, to the fact that just like Hitler, always talked about how Germany would get revenge on its enemies. Revenge fantasies are an invariable part of fantasy of uh, fascism. Uh, if you read, you know, Foundations of Geopolitics, Dugan quite literally says, you know, all of his enemies will burn in hell uh, forever and, you know, rot there uh, in the kind of ash heap uh, that Dugan sentences them to, right? So all of this is really rich stuff flourished by a lot of gimmicky uh, kind of intellectual syncretism. Uh, but why I do argue that it makes Dugan a little bit original uh, in terms of where he falls in the canon of fascist thinkers is Dugan uh, is willing to liberally draw from a variety of different postmodern authors uh, in order to try to build a case, at least occasionally, uh, for the importance of Russian nationalism. And again, this was innovative uh, in the sense of being you know, strategically sensible. Uh, in fact, you know, my friend Ben Burgess once said, you know, you wrote a lot about postmodern conservatism, Matt. And, you know, if there was anybody who would be like the philosopher of postmodern conservatism, it would probably be somebody like Alexander Dugan, who has all these nice things to say about Foucault and Derrida and Deleuze and all that stuff. Uh, and, you know, this can confuse people and it's intended to confuse people. Um, but, you know, the basic uh, way that Dugan will deploy these figures, uh, and Alain de Benoit and other far-right thinkers do the same thing, uh, is to say that, look, Foucault and Derrida have shown that any kind of universalism uh, is inherently invalid, epistemologically and morally. Uh, and, of course, the West being committed to universalistic liberalism is therefore engaged in an act of philosophical violence towards the rest of the world that reflects itself uh, in American imperialism. Uh, and Dugan will say each country should have its own distinct set of values that are appropriate to itself. Uh, and much like, you know, Deleuze celebrates a kind of difference between individuals uh, and within groups within society, we should have difference expressed in terms of differentiated nations. Uh, now, the consequence, of course, is that Dugan is then allowed to establish a authoritarian fascist regime in Russia. And anytime somebody criticizes him for doing that, uh, he can appeal to the cheesiest forms of cultural relativism to insulate himself from criticism uh, or to say, you know, you're engaged in an act of cultural or philosophical imperialism by telling us that we should do otherwise. Right. Uh, the hypocrisy of this, of course, though, is that Dugan has no problem at all uh, telling millions of dissidents in Russia uh, that their destiny is to do exactly what he or other people like him tell them what they should do, uh, and that they have no choice in the subject matter because the single ones uh, know a lot better than, as he sometimes calls it, the swarming multitudes or cows below, right? Uh, so like every other kind of fascist, uh, this kind of cheesy relativism very quickly uh, falls into the br brutal kind of authoritarianism where they actually feel that they are entitled or capable of imposing their own views on people. Uh, so there's an innovation uh, in Dugan drawing upon these postmodern authors uh, strategically and violently to try to justify relativism when he's trying to rebut accusations of fascism from the West. Uh, but we shouldn't take it too seriously since he is not sitting there calling for a Foucauldian society of anti-normalization, right, where a bunch of people gather together and do acid and engage in, you know, decadent orgies all night, let alone a delusing society of, you know, arboral formations without any kind of centralizing power dominating them, right? Uh, ultimately, what he wants is a fascistic society governed uh, by the single ones that will sweep his enemies into the dustbin of history and allow Dugan to assume what he thinks is his rightful place uh, atop the world hierarchy. Um, thank you for that really rich answer. So everyone knows I'm I'm not a political uh, philosopher. I'm more of a metaphysician. So a lot of my questions today have been philosophically um, of oriented towards your text because there's a lot of philosophy, but it's also a political text as well. So I was wondering for some of my viewers who maybe not be who are not um, aware of your work, and I will post links to all of your work when I post the video. 
I was wondering if you could maybe, what is the definition of postmodern conservatism? I'm sorry to just beat this over the head again. If you don't mind, if you could just kind of give us a nice definition in regards to maybe the examples that we've been talking about today. Sure, well, that's actually a nice segue to talking about my own positive philosophy, right? So I'm a liberal socialist. Um, if one wanted to talk about, you know, my three big political influences, not metaphysical, but political, uh, it'd be Wendy Brown, John Rawls, uh, and our good friend Karl Marx, right? Karl Marx, Karl. Uh, and from the Marxist tradition, I take very seriously the idea that we live or inhabit a postmodern moment uh, that's characterized by you know, a disbelief in meta narratives and other things, but also a lack of stability uh, of the sources of the self uh, that people have traditionally relied upon uh, to figure out who they are and where they belong in society. Uh, now, like all Marxists, I'm dialectical in my approach to postmodernity, right? I think it has emancipatory qualities. And I think it has regressive qualities. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the emancipatory qualities right now, but one of the regressive qualities is precisely that there are new forms of reactionary politics that can emerge in our postmodern moment that are stamped by its cultural features uh, and that can play or compete very effectively within it, uh, but still propound fundamentally anti-egalitarian, anti-democratic, and illiberal kinds of policies. Uh, and ideologies. And that's essentially what postmodern conservatism is, right? It's the form of reactionary politics that emerge within developed neoliberal states uh, that are characterized by a postmodern culture. Uh, and I give a lot of different examples of this uh, in my books, and I don't want to rehash it all too much since I know we talked about this before, right? Uh, but if you want a good example of this, uh, just look at Donald Trump, right? He's the kind of villain uh, of my story about all this. Uh, so many people have difficulty figuring out where Trump belongs politically. And they even characterize him as a mercurial figure. Uh, but what I point out is that Trump is a very much uh, a clear reaction figure. And if you wanted to situate him in the history of conservatism, it's very clear that he belongs there. But he's a postmodern reactionary figure. So how do we put these two things together, right? Well, think about Trump's worldview, right? It's very much shaped by a neoliberal ethic uh, that society consists of winners and losers. Uh, and that uh, the winners deserve what they have, and they owe no obligations whatsoever to the losers. Uh, and that to be a loser also means that you need to internalize precisely this sense that you fail uh, and that you deserve where it is that you wind up, right? Uh, and Trump is deeply anxious, like many reactionaries are throughout history, uh, that the people that he considers losers won't be content uh, with just staying where he thinks that they belong, that they will mobilize and to try to seize the advantages and the status and the wealth of the winners. And he has set himself up as the protector of the people uh, that have long enjoyed privilege and status and power in our society. Uh, and he's been very successful at doing that. Uh, but part of the reason he's successful is Trump very much understood uh, that we lived in a postmodern moment, not intellectually, but instinctively, right? Like a reality TV star. Uh, and this was expressed all the way back in his book, The Art of the Deal. Uh, where he lays out what can only be described as an entire epistemology, right? Uh, where he says, listen, people aren't that concerned with truth uh, in our world today. Very much like Mussolini, right? Uh, people get really excited and really animated when they think that they're participating in something that's the biggest, the greatest, the most exciting. Uh, and it doesn't even have to really be the biggest, the greatest, the most exciting, but you can make it out to be. Uh, this is what he calls truthful hyperbole, right? Uh, an innocent so-called kind of exaggeration that makes something out to be grander than it actually is, uh, or to use the Birkin term, more sublime than it actually is, right? To subject sublime qualities onto this. Uh, and you really see Trump adopt this aesthetic motif in his role as a protector of the winners against the so-called losers, right? Uh, and he's been very successful at this because his instinctual understanding of these kind of postmodern motifs have allowed him to navigate these spaces effectively, right? Particularly places like Twitter, where you know you and I are both uh, also very active. So it's an authoritarian meritocracy over egalitarianism, essentially. Exactly, right? I mean, think about the difference between conservative populism and Bernie Sanders style populism, right? Uh, conservative populism promises to make America great again, but for who, right? For the winners, right? For the people who are the deserving in the country. Uh, and the only way that it can do that is to push all the losers back into their place, whether we're talking about 
the liberal effeminate soy boy losers, right? Uh, or the illegal immigrants that are coming in uh, who are not part of our culture, uh, or, you know, the trans and LGBTQ people who are weird and unnatural and who aren't engaged in relationships that are comparable to normal so-called relationships, right? Uh, Bernie Sanders, by contrast, also advocates a kind of populism that I very much am sympathetic to, but it's inclusive, right? It's about we creating a country for all of us uh, where, you know, we will establish a shared world right, together that works for all, right? Uh, the highest and the lowest, uh, and especially prioritizing the least among us. And this is a vision that I think is far more uh, appealing and should be far more appealing for all of us than this Trumpist populist vision, right? Uh, but whether it's going to win out, you know, your, your guess is as, it's as good as fucking mine. I have no idea. I'm not in the business of prophesizing things. So I guess um, my last question will be, has liberalism failed and what's next? That's a good question. And I would say that liberalism of a certain type has failed, right? Uh, for a very long time, we've inhabited a neoliberal moment that's defined by just the ethos that I've talked about before that em is embodied in people like Trump. Uh, this idea that we should live in a society where each of us is responsible for cultivating our own personal capital, right? Uh, or capital in self uh, and trying to advance through a competitive market as best we can. Uh, and if we've fail to do that, uh, then we have no one to blame but ourselves. And if we succeed in doing that, uh, we owe nothing to anybody else, right? Uh, this horrifying doctrine uh, definitely has a grounding in certain kinds of possessive individualist liberalism, which is what my new book on liberal socialism is about. Uh, and liberals need to be very honest with themselves about how the reaction moment we are now living in is very much a consequence of drinking too deeply uh, of this neoliberal poison. But there's another kind of liberalism whose time I think has come, uh, and that's the liberalism embodied in people like Bernie Sanders or Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez or Lula in Brazil, right? Uh, and it's a kind of liberal socialism, right? Uh, it's a liberalism that will make good the promise uh, of securing liberty, equality, and solidarity or fraternity for all, uh, and especially for those who have never historically been the beneficiary. Uh, of liberal systems. Uh, and seen from this perspective, even if neoliberalism's time has done, I think that the promise of liberalism or liberal socialism has yet to be met. Uh, and it is an open promise and one that I hope that we will fulfill in good time. I think I'm with you there with the, this idea of liberal socialism. So for, for some of my viewers that don't know, you, you, you recently wrote a fantastic article on the Christian socialism of of Tillich, oh, um, who's a fantastic uh, philosopher as well, and Tillich, is, yeah. was one of, Tillich was one of the leading figures of socialism, this socialist movement um, in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Um, anyways, oh, I want yeah. these wanna... all have their roots in a kind of Christianity, also, right? I mean, we could talk about that some other time, but there is definitely a kind of Christian basis to liberal socialism that. You find in people like Tillich, uh, I would also argue that you can find it in people like uh, Gary Dorian right now or Cornell West, right? Uh, it's a very, very much a live movement. Um, another, this is another completely different question. And I just came to it thinking, and I think about this a lot as I'm maybe debating in spaces. Um, why do you think there is such a, there is such a negative reading of communism or any any kind of socialist themes in the states because they tend to have a very character uh, a caricature reading of marx and it's and it's always well look what marxism has done it's pol pot it's hitler it's the national socialists it's, it's it's the soviet union all over again and they don't tend to they haven't even read the tenets of of marx uh, just look at the zizek and and Peterson debate. I mean, that was embarrassing. Peterson oh, yeah. read the, the Communist Manifesto, and, and Zizek didn't even start off with that. He, he said, "Have you read anything else? Have you read the, the German ideology, the <laughs> yeah. Grundrisse, the paper, uh, the 1844 paper?" And they hadn't have done that. They hadn't even read that. So, is this a is this a McCarthyism again, or is this a? Do you think this is just a a lack of 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 reading or of rigorous understanding that's going on here? 
Well, let's be very clear, right? Uh, it's not just an intellectual issue. Uh, it's also an ideological issue. And sometimes this can take um, extremely pronounced forms, right? Uh, so let's be clear. In the 19, from about the 1910s through the 1930s and 40s and 50s, uh, many of the most affluent and powerful people in the United States uh, spent billions, if not tens of billions of dollars, uh, putting forward anti-communist propaganda, building anti-communist organizations, uh, convincing people that communism and socialism were fundamentally anti-American, anti-liberal, you name it, right? And it's very difficult uh, for any intellectual movement uh, like democratic socialism, uh, let alone a kind of political movement to survive in a climate that is that resolutely and well-moneyed, uh, resolutely hostile and well-moneyed, okay? Uh, now, I wanna be clear, right? Uh, democratic socialists and liberal socialists need to be emphatic about repudiating the authoritarian legacy of Marxism. And I don't think that you, this can just take the form of saying like, well, these weren't really Marxists, right? Uh, clearly, Stalinism, Maoism drew heavily Pol Pot uh, on a certain kind of Marxist idea uh, and used that to justify horrible atrocities, right? Uh, and I also want to be very clear that the kind of command economy socialism associated especially with Stalinism, right? Uh, but, you know, throughout the Soviet Union uh, failed catastrophically in terms of delivering the goods, right? But I don't think that that means that we need to throw away Marx, uh, because I think that had Marx actually lived to the 20th century, he would have been horrified by these movements and rightly condemned them as the most utter perversion uh, of his thought, because Marx uh, was in many ways a Republican, democratic thinker. Uh, he constantly emphasized the need for the people uh, to be actively involved in every respect uh, in their own governments. Uh, and you can just read the Civil War in France, right, where he talks a great deal about how workers' councils need to be entirely accountable to the people who elected them. Uh, and if they fail to do so, they should be removed from office immediately, right? Uh, but you know, beyond just these kinds of technical um, and procedural insistences that you see in Marxism, at the basis of Marxism is a kind of Aristotelian ideal uh, that draws very heavily on the Enlightenment uh, to insist that the ultimate goal of any society should be human flourishing and human freedom, but properly understood. Uh, and where Marx really contributes to the history of not just political thought, but the history of the history of human ontology uh, as an awareness of the extent to which we are codependent creatures uh, and that my free development is entirely predicated in many respects on your free development, right? The free development of each is a precondition for the free development of all. Uh, and Marx posits that sometime in the future, we will be able to overcome the forms of ideology and reification, uh, which are created by human beings and then in turn become their own shackles uh, to face the world squarely as it is, to produce uh, in a way that is conducive to everyone's benefit. Uh, and he hypothesizes that one day in the future, for the first time, we will have a rational society uh, that will emphasize the free development of human powers as an end in itself, which is very different than what we have now, where human powers, if they are developed at all, are developed for the exploitation of capital, right? Uh, which is a very dehumanizing and alienating kind of thing. So I think that this is an inspiring moral project, right? It's a kind of democratized Aristotle, if you want to call it that, with a lot of Hegelianism thrown in. Uh, and how we can instantiate this project uh, is a difficult question. I think that we need to retain a lot more liberal institutions than Marx might be willing to permit, but I'm not prepared to give up on it, right? I think that it's an inspiring ideal. Uh, it's a humanist ideal, and it's one that whose time is still yet to come, I think. And for some of those that don't know you as much as I do, you're also, you know, you also do your your fair share of activism. Like you're a part of the, I believe you're a part of the Socialist Party. Yep. You've done work with the NDP in Canada. I know you're now in the States, but um, yeah, you you write um, monthly articles and area, era, is it Aereo? Aereo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and many other articles um, that I'll link as well too. I want to thank you so much for coming here today answering all my questions and your book is fantastic i'll make sure to post a link there from from amazon or from the publisher and um yeah just thank you so much for being here with me yeah thanks buddy it was a lot of fun and uh yeah i'll see you when i when i get back in town okay all right see you too sure. thanks for coming, yeah. matt